Welcome wrestling fans, welcome to Curtain Jerk, and as always, I'm your host, Jacob Grindy, reporting for the Main Event Marks YouTube channel and the Dragon Suplex Podcasting Network. I usually jump on here and say it's been a big week in pro wrestling, and don't get me wrong, it has been, it has been, but I'm a little saddened, I'm a little saddened at the uh, death of the uh, Foo Fighters drummer here. Uh, Foo Fighters, a band that I've enjoyed my entire life, pretty much, uh, since I've been a little kid. I saw Learn to Fly. I saw him, you know, the Dave Grohl and the rest of the band dressing up, you know, as flight attendants and as uh, just the general uh, public going onto a, a plane. I thought that was hilarious, and I've been hooked ever since. Um, and, you know, the guy always killed it. He was always known to be the drummer that passed the Dave Grohl test. Of course, Dave Grohl, uh, known for percussion himself and Nirvana and everything. So, just like a few episodes ago, I had to dedicate the uh, show to Scott Hall, the late great Scott Hall, someone who I've also been a fan of my whole life. This one goes out to Taylor Hawkins of the Foo Fighters and Alanis Morissette fame. But that's not the only sad news that came about uh, this week as far as uh, the entertainment that I take in. Triple H uh, retired from the world of pro wrestling. I, mean, I guess not the world of pro wrestling, but from in-ring competition. A guy I've seen wrestle my entire life, um, you know, from coming in to the fold with the European title, standing next to Shawn Michaels, uh, coming into his own with uh, the ladder match from 1998 SummerSlam against The Rock, and kind of when everyone was leaving the WWE, when, you know, uh, Sean was kind of out of it, Stone Cold took his ball and went home, The Rock was making movies, Triple H put the company on his back. Uh, you know, the Helmsley McMahon era isn't looked at as fondly as the Attitude Era, but it was definitely a necessary era to get, you know, guys like Kurt Angle over, to get to the point where you can get Batista and Randy Orton over, to get to the point where, uh, you know, John Cena got over. I mean, those are a laundry list of guys that he helped get there, which led to the Ruthless Aggression Era. I would say Triple H's career, uh, you know, looking back, is he is the bridge that got them from the Attitude Era to the Ruthless Aggression Era. And then he also started the era that we see now. I mean, you know, very influential with Seth Rollins, of course, leading the way of NXT, the way we've all loved it with the black and gold brand. So, you know, you, I, I got to admit, like, you know, he wasn't always my favorite when he was just constantly putting himself over on Raw, but he more than made up for it with the black and gold era version of NXT that we all love. And uh, it's sad to see him go. It's sad to see, you know, the... Uh, Excellence of execution, never being able to wrestle another match. Uh, he, they called it a cardiac event earlier this year when he stepped away from NXT. But when he was retiring, he did say it was um, a heart attack. So he just called it, as we all kind of uh, understood it at the time. Uh, I Yeah, I can't believe a few weeks out of WrestleMania. This is not good for the company. I mean... Going into WrestleMania, there's a lot more sad headlines than there are happy headlines. Of course, you got all these celebrities coming in. You got Stone Cold coming back, which is good. But then, you know, you had the Big E neck injury, which is not good. You had the Scott Hall death, which is not good. And now you have Triple H retiring. This isn't good headlinings. This doesn't make people uh, excited for the spectacle, for the stupendous nature of WrestleMania. Um... This is uh, one more thing that I think they're going to have to uh, combat leading into WrestleMania. I mean, it's a week away. Uh, and like I said last time, I think UFC is a lot more interesting right now with this Colby Cutting Covington, Jorge Masvidal thing. A little bit of an update. Jorge did get arrested Wednesday evening facing two charges, of aggressive battery and criminal mischief. Uh, Maki Kawa, whoever the hell that is, stated on Twitter that Masvidal is free now, hashtag free Kane, around 5 a.m. March 24th. So he did just spend one night in jail, got off, probably, you know, uh, some bail, had to get paid or something like that, and he hasn't been charged yet. Uh, even though there is a video of him just running up and just punching Colby Covington. Apparently, Colby Covington uh, lost a tooth 
uh, and uh, people are not kind of uh, kind of uh, happy with uh, with Covington as far as you know UFC Khabib Gurmadagamadov weighed in. Of course, he was the victim of harassment from Conor McGregor, so he pretty much doesn't like the way Covington is harassing Jorge. Said he got what he deserves. He is upset that the police even got involved. He wants Covington to be blacklisted from MMA for calling the police. Uh, if you are stronger than someone inside the octagon, that does not mean you can insult their children, which is, I mean, a very good point that uh, Khabib became, you know, brought to everyone's attention, brought to my attention. Uh, once you have gone down the path, then be ready to back up your words. Which uh, Khabib, with his, uh, you know, English being a, a second language, kind of uh, has this really uh, fun way of just cutting to the point, and he it, it leads to really good quotes like that. Once you have gone down the path, then be ready to back up your words. Like knowing that this guy is an actual badass saying these kinds of things, just kind of makes it seem like it's like Steven Seagal in real life or something like that. Uh, you were attacked by a professional fighter the same as you are. The same size, and you go pre and then you go press charges. Here he is saying this again. I think all welterweights should refuse to fight Colby. That's insane. Jorge did say at the press conference after the fight that he still thinks that uh, Col Covington is a pussy and he would fight him in the street. So he said it. And then Covington apparently right after the fight said after win you know after winning the five rounds uh, that. The fight is ready for five more. He's ready for five more rounds in the parking lot. So, uh, you know, Covington, you know, kind of said he was ready to fight Jorge in the streets, in the parking lot. Five more rounds, you know, was kind of uh, showing off to the press. And then when there was no press around, only social media and things like that, Jorge did uh, call his bluff a little bit. I know. Uh, uh, Nick Diaz weighed in and said that uh, Jorge was in the wrong and everything like that. So there are people within MMA circles that do have Covington's back, but Khabib, I would say, is a uh, you know a much more notable name, a much more respected name than most people in MMA, and he is defending Masvidal. Uh, Covington, uh, you know, was you know it was a sneak attack indeed, but you know. If you're going to like provoke him and then say you're ready to fight him right after the fight, I kind of see where Khabib's coming from here. Uh, the sneak attack is fucked up. You know, you kind of want it to be like an old Western style duel or something, but I guess it doesn't really work like that, especially if you're trying to avoid charges, which uh, Jorge unfortunately did not at this point, it looks like. But yeah, this is, this is more interesting than anything coming out of WrestleMania uh, so far. I mean, I'm not really, you know, Logan Paul and Jake Paul, great heels in the boxing world, but um, they kind of, when they cross over to wrestling and they're and he's kind of just the Miz's buddy, it kind of gets lost. Of course, Jackass star Johnny Knoxville is, uh, does all these crazy stunts and being in WrestleMania, being involved in WrestleMania is just one more of these stunts. Um, you know, these are guys that I'm entertained by outside of the world of wrestling. But if you keep bringing all of them in, uh, you know, uh, I, Pat McAfee, love him on commentary. But I saw him wrestle Adam Cole already. So it's not like um, it, we're seeing something unprecedented here against Austin Theory. So all these celebrities they're bringing in, I kind of enjoy them being who they are outside of wrestling more so than I do in wrestling. One or two would have been cool, but three. And at this point, Stone Cold is like a celebrity doing you know commercials with Ice T, being in movies with Sylvester Stallone. So I, I feel like you got four celebrities trying to put band aids on bullet wounds of a WrestleMania card that really doesn't shape up to much. Uh, Seth Rollins, of course, hasn't you know been announced to wrestle uh, Cody Rhodes, but I feel like you got Cody Rhodes and Seth. And you got Edge and AJ Styles. Those are only two matches across two nights that people are going to enjoy bell to bell. And the spectacle of it all, you know, you can't finesse everything. You know, Kobe Bryant was a great finesser in the world of basketball, but he stood, you know, he he came in early and left late at practice every day to make sure he had the skills to back up the finesse. And I don't know if WrestleMania has that Mamba mentality this year. But we're going to jump over 
to NOAA, actually. NOAA GHC national title match happened in Corrigan Hall. Uh, I love the graphics running down the lineage of the championship history. They do it in New Japan, and I love seeing it in NOAA, especially because I don't know the history as much as I do in New Japan. Uh, Hideki Suzuki, fresh off of his NXT run, standing in the background of Diamond Mind. Here he is getting a title match. How cool would it be if all of Diamond Mind went to Noah? I'd love seeing the Creed brothers, and I would love seeing Roderick Strong uh, in Noah as well. And then uh, Malcolm Biggins would be hilarious too. But we just got one member of uh, Diamond Mind and Hideki Suzuki crossing over. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't mind a Suzuki Goon. Like a few years ago, Suzuki Goon went from New Japan, the whole faction, into Noah. Uh, I would love, in, a, in my fantasy book and brain, would love to see Diamond Mind just jumping over to Noah here. I think Roderick Strong would be a world title contender in Noah, and he doesn't seem to be in NXT. But moving on from my fantasy booking uh, brain, the the champion, um, Masak, hold on, Funaki, uh, Masaku Nusu, <laughs> Funaki, sorry I can't say that right, I do got Funaki down. Uh, he started wrestling in 1985, 53 years old. Uh, I bet uh, Suzuki wishes he was still a valet in a tracksuit in the WWE minor leagues because he got tapped out like a bitch in eight minutes. Just kidding. It was a good match. It was a fun match. It hooked me. I was definitely shocked that it ended so quickly. You would never have seen something like that in New Japan. New Japan, uh, you know, when they ring the bell for the main events, they go 30 minutes. Same with AEW. And I mean, WWE is at least going 10 or 15, but this was an eight minute fight. That seems more like an MMA fight. I mean, they they once it went to the ground, it stayed on the ground, and Funaki just tapped him out. Uh, a lot of older champions in Noah. That's how I kind of came to be a fan of Noah. So I can't really complain. But listening to other podcasts and reading on Twitter, a lot of Noah faithful are really clamoring for this old guard to kind of step aside. But with Funaki and with Fujita, it looks like they're not ready to step aside, and it's kind of maybe causing some conflict in the back. Uh, I don't know why they put the title on these guys who look like they refuse to uh, do the job for these younger guys. Because sure, I got hooked by these older guys, but I'm not going to stay around if these older guys just win over and over again. I remember back in the day, I was watching Impact with some fans who were a bit of elapsed fans, as we would call them, in, uh, you know, in the WWE realm, but we were watching Impact, and it was like Kevin Nash ran out, Sting ran out, Booker T, Mick Foley, and these Laps fans were loving it. They were like, holy shit, this is awesome. Does this happen every week? And we said, we said, yeah, I mean, you know, it does happen every week. And then next week rolled around, and I said, do you guys want to watch it? And they are like, no. So yeah, you can get really excited about these old veteran guys coming in, but, uh, if, if the old veteran guys don't tell the story where they're falling off and you see the newer guys come to be, come you know surpass them, uh, laps fans and fans that are just wanting to see the stars do it one more time, they're only going to be there for a few months. But I'm going to follow the story of Noah uh, into 2022. Uh, Noah is you know uh, interesting to me. I love New Japan. We're going to be talking about New Japan next episode. Uh, but right now we're going to be jumping in to AEW from Austin, Texas this week. Both shows from Austin, Texas. Jericho getting more yoked week after week. 51 years old. Uh, comparing him to Funaki and Noah, he is just no comparison. He is getting jacked, you know, surpassing, you know, Funaki, the other uh, notable guy on this episode from Noah. Dax Harwood, MVP of this week on both shows. Had a great match and an even better promo, I would say. MJF coming out, cutting a promo on Wardlow. And I'm not sure what happened here. I know he did use some like Hebrew words. He also called himself the devil. But for some reason, this Texas crowd just started chanting uh, Jesus at him. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. MJF hears it. And I think this is a bit of earnesty from him. Uh, not what he's about to say, but like uh, just his facial expression. He was a little pissed off that he was losing the crowd in this promo. So he fires back at them, saying that he's going to hang Wardlow on the cross just like Jesus. Holy shit, mic drop moment. The crowd, was they didn't know what to do. He shut 10,000 people up at once. Uh, shocking as fuck. Uh, he threatens to, to you know cut Wardlow off to pay him to sit at home. 
much like 50 Cent did with Young Buck back in the day in G Unit, he is going to keep him under contract so he doesn't become a star. And Warlow comes out, gets held back by a lot of security. Um, but this is a pretty interesting storyline. I don't know if we're going to get the the Wardlow buying a ticket or Wardlow wearing a mask. I'm interested to see where it goes. It looks like we're in this one for the long haul. MJF is continues to be the best part of AEW, I would say, on the mic. Uh, and he has been for years. He hasn't had a title. I mean, he's got the Dynamite Diamond Ring. But uh, it's just amazing to see. And I think uh, after this Wardlow storyline, I think he is the sole person that could take the title from Hangman Page and I would be happy with. Uh, Trent is pissed at Wheeler Yuta uh, for getting in the ring last night, or getting in the ring last week. The two best friend guys uh, aren't best friends right now. They're kind of beefing, and Yuta says he doesn't join the wrestling industry to be the, the best friend he can be, but to be the best wrestler he can be. I also found out through Trent shit talking here a little bit that Chuck and Cassidy actually trained Yuta. I know that Yuta you know, got some base training and then went to Mishinoku Pro to learn from Sasuke and then went to MLW, kind of came up through Beyond and everything. But I didn't know who initially trained him, but it looks like I guess he got trained in Shikara with Chuck and Cassidy. Cole, Adam Cole that is, calls out Hangman Page. Hangman Page doesn't back down. Cole says, if you're a man, you'll come out and face us all three of us talking about him and Red Dragon at once, which is a hilarious line. Uh, three on one attack here. Jurassic Express make the save. But I like the champion not backing down here. Uh, I like, um, you know, like I said before, this is the most important AEW title reign in history. He is the first AEW champion that did not come from the WWE. So to kind of to solidify the whole company as something relevant and big, you need to make sure that Hangman Page's title reign is relevant and big. Unfortunately, Adam Cole stole the world title here and went to the back. Uh, and then we got this segment that everyone seemed to be talking about the the night, the you know, the morning after. Uh, speaking of morning after, if you know what I'm saying, Sammy and Ty Conti out there talking tons of shit. Dan Lambert comes out. He gives a promo where he just kind of just you know, slaughters everyone like he usually does, and then he kisses the TNT title uh, to kind of mock Sammy Guevara losing the TNT title to Scorpio Sky, and then Ty Conti, uh, you know, kind of says, you know, or I think it was Sammy Guevara says, like, we know we live in your head rent-free, but if you knew what we did with that title when I won it, let's just say we now live in your mouth. Holy shit, what a line, hilarious line. Um, and then the next day, uh, Ty Conti posts on Twitter a picture of uh, them naked, where the belt is just covering them up. Um, you know, it's you know, there, nothing's exposed here, but you can you know, little to the imagination here. Pulling an Xavier Woods and Page within the confines of the storyline of the wrestling show. You, get, I, I mean. I'm entertained by it, and I, I think that they're going to, literally, in this storyline, they're filling the void of Brandy and Cody, but I think in actuality, as far as the AW fan base, they're filling the void of uh, what Brandy and Cody left behind. They're the couple that people want to boo, and uh, you know, non-fans are like, why are you booing them? Because they're you know attractive and successful, and I guess that's not exactly it, but there is that undertone of you're just booing this young, attractive couple for showing off that they're young and attractive, which it can get some heat. I'm sure a certain segment of the fan thinks it's really cool, and that's what you need. You need heat, you need people thinking you're cool, and uh, you need people talking about you, and that's exactly what this segment did. That's exactly what the picture on Twitter did. Uh, and I think to have a reality show is cool, was cool maybe in the 2000s, and it kind of got passe in the 2010s. So now that we're in, uh, you know, the 2020s, um, I think that people that are, you know, Guevara's age and Ty Conti's age, they just want to get big on social media. That's kind of their reality show. So they don't really need to have the roads to the top or the Miz and misses to get the fan base that they are clamoring after. They just need to get big on Twitter and Instagram and TikTok and all that stuff. And that's what they're doing. And I think... Um, a lot of these older fans, who traditional wrestling fans who have been watching for a while, can't really connect with that because they don't see it as well as some people who are just scrolling on their timelines and see, oh, these people are attractive, they're traveling the world together, they're young and in love, they're TV stars, they're going to be more hooked than, um, you know, 
the quote unquote neck beards, the quote unquote uh, nerds that watch uh, AEW. I'm not calling it these people that, especially if you're listening to this show, you're just a wrestling fan. But the wrestling fans skew older, and I think people like Sammy Guevara and Ty Conti can hook a younger fan base. Maybe, you know, definitely a younger female fan base on. And maybe they'll watch people like Thunder Rosa and enjoy what she has to offer as well. She comes out in Austin, Texas, by the way. Huge pop. Like Triple H wearing a jean vest over leather jacket at MSG pop. Uh, gets attacked by Nyla Rose. This feels like they're rehashing an old angle, but I'm fine with it if it just is, you know, the first Rose of Victory in a long title reign. Moving on to Rampage, House of Black kills Fuego Del Sol to a huge ovation. I mean, you're not going to boo these guys. They're just fucking cool. Don't get me wrong. They're scary. No doubt about that. But they're cool. And uh, I don't know if that's the desired effect here. Uh, but, I mean, they're the some they're the biggest babyface faction, I think, in all of AEW. Like, uh, if you do uh, Jericho uh, Appreciation Society versus House of Black, House of Black is going to get babyfaced in a heartbeat. Uh, I think even if you do like Dark Order versus House of Black, they're going to get babyfaced in a heartbeat. Even like Best Friends, I think you know a, a happy-go-lucky group like that would would babyface House of Black just because they're so fucking cool. Scorpio Sky closing the forbidden door to his title reign I thought was just a clever line to just say so much and, uh, you know, kind of uh, get heat. I mean, you know, everyone loves seeing guys from all over the place come and wrestle for the TNT title. Scorpio Sky shut that down. I thought that was a clever way to uh, kind of separate his title reign against others in the past. QT Marshall coming out, uh, giving Hook a certificate of accomplishment. I thought that was hilarious because, of course, Hook, you know, action bronze in plays, people vibe to the music. He comes out and just smashes Aaron Solo's face into the uh, plaque that QT tried to give him, walks up the ramp, and then Danhausen shows up trying to curse Hook. I guess they just wanted that gift. They just wanted that meme of them standing there together. But uh, Danhausen was funny in Ring of Honor. But the lack of explanation uh, of him even being around in AEW or being with best friends or whatever the hell is happening with uh, Dan Housen in AEW is not being explained and is just kind of annoying to me. I don't know why they don't just do a vignette on him and just do a little background on him because, I mean, not as many people watched Ring of Honor that watch AEW. And I think it could be argued that more people watch Dan Housen on the, online, but I don't think it's the same people. So I just want a little bit of an explanation on why Dan Housen even showed up, what he's doing here, and what he is in AEW. Because I can tell you there's a lot of people that don't understand like me. I mean, I watched, I watched it all, and I don't understand. I don't think it's ever been explained to us on the body of an AEW television show. So uh, you're kind of ruining this uh, otherwise funny character just because you're not giving him... Uh, good TV time. Of course, you're giving him the TV time. He's on the television, but I just we just don't know why. But jumping to the ranking system that we do every show, we rank the AEW matches from worst to first, and we have 10 big matches from AEW. Number 10 out of 10 is Nyla Rose versus Maddie Wankowski, a uh, you know, Thunder Rosa trainee, makes another appearance on AEW, only to get Beast Bomb, one, two, three. Nyla Rose whoops so much ass, she has to sit in the final spot. Unfortunately for the ladies' division, the two matches representing the ladies' division are uh, the two least popular matches, in my opinion. Layla Hirsch versus Red Velvet, double knees to the back of Layla, German by Layla, uh, Foreign object connects one, two, three. Layla gets the victory. Statlander did come out and try to uh, take the uh, larger foreign object from Layla, but she had a smaller one that she used on Red Velvet. And then, uh, you know, Lafim, this the Statlander, whatever this new gimmick is, she uh, attacks Layla after the match. Number eight, uh, Varsity Blondes versus Mox and Danielson. I love both these tag teams, but. You know, uh, Mox and Danielson just whooped so much ass, so it has to sit at number eight. Julia Hart pouts on the steps. Uh, Julia Hart pouting. I've never seen someone with an eye patch 
pout. I've never seen someone effectively take away the badassness of wearing an eye patch like Julia Hart does. And if that's what they're going for, she is destroying it. Larry, a German combination, pile driver, one, two, Garrison breaks it up. Blondes just get stomped out and choked out. Uh, and then they tap out. Uh, Regal cuts a promo. Mox comes out and tells the world that their name is the Blackpool Combat Club. What a fucking cool ass name. Sounds like they're like soccer hooligans or like fight club or something like that. It just is super cool. Badass name, badass group. Definitely quickly became my favorite tag team in AEW. If I'm tuning into AEW and there's an MJF promo and there's a Mox and Danielson match, I'm going to enjoy myself. The rest of the two hours or one hour or whatever it is um, could be anything. But if those two things are happening on the show, I'm, you know, I'm hooked. I'm giving it two thumbs up. Number seven out of ten, Archer versus Dustin Rhodes. Uh, they start brawling early on the top of the ramp. These two Texans, you can tell, are super into this match. Uh, Archer exposes the turnbuckle. Dustin bleeding. Dustin's hit a crossroads, I guess. You know, that finisher is up for grabs here in AEW now that Cody is signed to WWE. Archer can't put him away. Archer runs into the exposed buckle. Roll up. One, two, three. Dustin Rhodes gets the victory. Number six out of ten. Red Dragon versus five and ten of the Dark Order. Ten cleaning house. Almost gets lured in by Red Dragon on the outside, kind of doing an old school brain busters thing. But he just powers through it. But then they slowly wear down, uh, going after the leg that has the leg brace on it. Five does get a hot tag, but it was too, you know, a little too late. Red Dragon turns the mask of ten around and double teams five. One, two, three. Red Dragon gets the victory. A little bit after the match, uh, they're jumping five. Jurassic Express come to the aid, uh, but leave their titles on the apron. Adam Cole runs out and steals the tag titles, too. So on Dynamite, they stole the world title, and on rampage they stole the tag titles so you know the old undisputed era now have all the titles because they just went and stole it um uh, we'll see where this goes i'm not too intrigued by it i don't want i think this means that adam cole won't actually win the title but there's this little litmus test of how he looks with the title which as long as hangman page doesn't drop the title on all of this i am fine but number five out of ten right there at the halfway point jericho and garcia Versus Silver and Reynolds of the Dark Order. Silver and Reynolds hit a tope brain buster combination to Jericho. Jericho, when he's getting up, slaps the steps. And that gets the rest of the Dark Order kicked to the back. Hager destroys Silver. Jericho hits Reynolds with a bat. Garcia taps Reynolds out. The Jericho Appreciation Society. Hilarious promo beforehand. And they're just entertaining as hell in the ring. I think that these five guys in this faction together are more funny than any Saturday Night Live cast that I've seen in my lifetime. Just the facial expressions and these promos just crack me up every time. Number four out of ten, Swerve versus Ricky Starks, the main event of Rampage. Dueling chance here, hot-ass crowd for this one. Uh, you know, uh, action spills to the floor. Crowd is still dueling chance. Sloppy action here a little bit, but they do pick it up. Powerbomb, DDT, 1-2, Swerve kicks out. Flatliner, 1-2, Starks kicks out. Double Stomp, 1-2, Starks kicks out again. Hob interferes. Ricky gets the victory. Uh, as they're celebrating, they got this big banner uh, that celebrates uh, Ricky Starks' victory. The entourage here in his hometown. Keith Lee doesn't give a fuck. He runs through it, destroys the entourage. Starts brawling with Hobbs. Starks and Swerve start brawling again. Refs and security come out, try to uh, you know separate the two as they go off air on Rampage. Uh, you know, sign me up. This is a fun little tag team uh, war going on here. Team Taz and Swerve and Lee. It seems like it's exclusively on Rampage this feud as well. But number three out of ten. Speaking of exclusively on Rampage, the, these final three are all matches from Dynamite. So Rampage usually has some good matches on it, but this week they're off the podium. Cole versus Lethal. A lot of Ring of Honor history here. Lethal dives on uh, on Cole. Cole kind of knows that he's going to dive three times because you know he watches Jay Lethal and Ring of Honor just like we all do. So he sees it coming, so he tries to move, but he doesn't escape the leap off the apron. I thought that was nice. Red Dragon shows up on the ramp. Cole uh, going for the boom. Uh, lethal, uh, you know, kind of counters with the cutter. Uh, Panama Sunrise 1 2. Lethal kicks out Red Dragon on the apron. 
Adam Cole hits a low blow like an asshole. Boom, knee one, two, three. Uh, Adam Cole gets a victory here. But number one and two, definitely, they were the first two matches on Dynamite, and they were by far my first two matches. Uh, Sting, Darby Allin, and the Hardys versus Private Party, Butcher and the Blade, representing A. H O or whatever the hell that faction is. Uh, this match was awesome. Just a brawl right away. Andrade helping his faction, uh, even though he's not in the match. Butcher just keeps slamming Darby into the sides of the aisle. Private Party hits a double in Zaguri off the ramp to Matt. Uh, Jeff Hardy, as a brawl in the concession stands, as a brawl in the concourse area of the arena, he finds a ladder. Uh, uses the ladder to get onto a window ledge that's like 20 feet in the air, hitting a swanton bomb onto Butcher and the Blade. Still doing it after all these years. You know, it takes me back to WrestleMania 2000 when he hits Bubba Dudley with this. It takes me back to uh, the Raw before Royal Rumble 2008 when he jumps off the Titantron onto Randy Orton. It was just, you know, amazing to see him do it after all these years. I'm so glad he's in AEW. Definitely unprofessional in... Uh, how he got to AEW, but I mean, who cares? It was entertaining to watch or just find out about. I love how AEW brawls in the concourse area. It kind of reminds me of WCW, Kevin Sullivan and Chris Benoit with Dusty Rhodes on commentary. There's a woman in the man's bathroom. Takes me back. Scorpion death drop while Matt Hardy hits the twist of fate in the ring. One, two, three. What a cool way to end a really cool match. And that's it to number two only because of the really amazing singles match that kicked off Dynamite, CM Punk versus Dax Harwood. Like I said, Dax Harwood, my MVP out of all of AEW this week. Ass boys at ringside, making fools of themselves as they do best. Uh, Dax controlling the pace uh, while biting, you know, pulling at Punk's nose, doing all kinds of stuff. Forearm battle leads to Punk hitting a drop kick. Punk goes for an elbow. Dax cuts him off. Huge suplex. Cash comes... Or, uh, Dax cuts him off and Cash comes out. Uh, Punk counters a cross body into an Anaconda vice. Dax lands a springboard powerbomb at one point. That looked really cool. Dax uh, slips out of the GTS and locks in a sharpshooter. Of course, these two men known for uh, their love of Bret Hart here. So it's a sharpshooter, not a Scorpion Deathlock. Uh, Punk counters the, you know, the, the sharpshooter into an Anaconda vice. Dax taps out, amazing match, amazing week in AEW, uh, amazing match from Noah, go out and watch that, Colby Cuttington and Jorge Mastanov just continue to uh, entertain the MMA world, while the WrestleMania build kind of leaves a lot to be desired, I don't watch WWE week to week, but the people that do seem to be um, underwhelmed by Roman and Brock, and I think if you don't like Roman and Brock, uh, then you're pretty much not enjoying this WrestleMania build from a SmackDown perspective. And then Seth Rollins gets the most TV time out of anybody on Raw, and they can't even tell you the match he's, you know, going to wrestle. And then you got Kevin Owens trying to work a program with someone who's not out there. This Mania build is a dud so far. Don't get me wrong. I'm going to watch it just like everybody else. But I'm really enjoying the wrestling I am watching and the stuff that I am keeping up with. And every time I try to pay attention to WWE, uh, I get a little bored. I'm not going to lie, guys. But I hope you guys aren't bored with this show. Let me know in the comments. Let me know on social media what you think of the show. And always fly high. I'm out.